Hey everybody and welcome to the True Crime Squad. This is Katie Weaver. I'm here with my sister, co-host, and partner in crime, Christy Brower. Hello. Hello. Hey everybody. It's welcome. <laughs> I am deeming us the most unproblematic true crime channel in all of the land. Now, some of yeah. you might have true crime we channels too, are. and maybe you're deeming yourselves that, but my God. The amount of drama going on amongst different uh, true crime channels right now is blowing my mind. And I'm not going to call them out because I don't want into we, their drama. But we just, don't, we just don't play that. Mm -mm. I'm blown away at all the drama. They let's, can keep it. Let's just shine light on cases. I'm a no drama llama. I'm yeah. no drama llama. My mind is blown. It is officially blown. But we'll just be over here in our corner playing with our toys. And you guys mm -hmm. just come over here and play with us, and we will just so not have that. Yeah. yeah. We just we don't do that. So. <laughs> yeah. So here we are. Well, at any rate, it's Wednesday. And so, yes, of course, this is. is our Wednesday episode, but we're going to be back at 7 p.m. Mountain for the uh, case updates. <laughs> I've tried so hard to say. Oh, yeah. Two or three different things that weren't right. <laughs> Case updates. And I'm glad for it because uh, there's always a lot going on. But we've got a lot going on here. Speaking of a lot going on, I don't know what it's like at you guys' houses, but we have winter knocking on the door. We're going to have snow in the morning, I'm pretty mm -hmm. sure. We are going to bed tonight to some cold, shitty rain, and we're going to wake up to snow. Yeah, I bet we are. Boo! We've got you know, a pretty good long fall, really. For us, this has been great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it also could easily warm up again and it give could. us another little stretch of fall. It typically does in November, so mm -hmm. we'll see. But I, yeah, I can't cry about it at all. We've had such a gorgeous. I don't fall. hate it. Yeah, yeah, we have. And honestly, I'm usually getting kind of ready for the snow when it comes. Yeah, I mean that lasts for a day or two, and then you know. <laughs> Then, then why I do I live where the air hurts my face? The weather again. Yes. Yeah. Because it is it is the state pastime in Idaho mm -hmm. to bitch about the weather. Apparently it is. Yeah. Especially southeastern Idaho, because we have such varied <laughs> weather here. But whatever. We're gonna be fine. Yeah. Oh yeah. It'll be good. I'm ready. It's all good. Yeah. Well, we've got uh a lot going on today. You do. So I think we're going to dive right in. Christy, you're going to kick us off with a crime news update? No, some WTF oh. news. <laughs> yes, okay. <laughs> so friends, this guy right here uh, gave some pilots on an Alaska Airlines flight a hell of a scare a few days ago. Yeah. This is Joseph Emerson. Joseph Emerson was riding in the jump seat as a guest in the cockpit on a flight with 83 people on it mm -hmm. um, on an Alaska Airlines flight. And, uh, well, Joseph kind of freaked out while he mm -hmm. was on that plane. We know a little more about what happened and maybe a little bit about why it happened than we did a few days ago. So he was an off-duty Alaska Airlines pilot. This is a common thing that pilots will travel, you know, wherever they need to go, just riding along with other pilots. It's just a thing they do. So this was a flight from Seattle to San Francisco. And uh, apparently 48 hours before this flight, uh, Joseph had had some magic mushrooms. And he'd been struggling with some mental health issues recently. And uh, while he was sitting in the plane, in, in, the, in the cockpit there, he tears off his headset. He yells, I am not okay, and reaches for the shutoff handles to the fuel to both engines of the plane. 
and he pushes him part way down before one of the pilots got a hold of him, pushed him back up. So really everything was okay. The flight was okay. But they kind of wrestled him down and uh, they got him out of the cockpit and they locked the po- cockpit and they called uh-huh. the police in Portland and said, uh, we're on our way and please have the cops there when you get there because when we get there, because uh, we got a problem. Yeah. Emerson actually um, told the uh, flight attendants that they needed to cuff him. Wow. And that uh, if he didn't, it's going to be bad. Like he knew he was about to do something terrible and had the wherewithal to say, I'm not okay. Uh-huh. You need to cuff me. Like he knew something was bad. Yeah. So they got I mean, him back it, it the slays plane. me. I mean, obviously get him out of the cockpit. Yes. But they just yeah. turn him loose on the flight attendants and 83 other unsuspecting people. I mean, I think they were just like, you guys got to subdue this guy. We got to fly the yes. plane. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's just not all the way around. Yeah, Yeah. it was very scary. So the flight attendants cuffed him. They held him at the back of the plane until they could get the plane landed. Um, They heard, the flight attendants heard him say, I messed everything up and that he tried to kill everybody, that he said those things aloud. Oh, good Lord. He has now told the police that he thought what was happening was a dream, that he was very much not in his right mind. Mm -hmm. He did talk to the police. He told the police he hadn't slept in 40 hours and was going through some kind of a mental health crisis. I had also, Oh, go ahead. He, he, uh, he also said that he pulled both emergency shutoff handles because he thought he was dreaming and he was trying to wake up. Oh, good Lord. That he thought that the pilots weren't paying attention or something, he was definitely having a very altered reality experience. I thought I had read that he was doing mushrooms. Yeah, I said that. Magic mushrooms. Well, you did. Oh, Mm -hmm. well, okay. I'm coming back to the party. (laughs) Yeah, where you been? I I don't know. 48 hours before. Yes, okay. He had used, you know, psychedelic magic mushrooms. Um, And this was the first time he had, and so he really didn't know how they would impact him. Mm. Um, He told the police, I'm admitting to what I did. I'm not fighting any charges you want to bring against me. Um, So 83 felony counts of attempted murder, 83 misdemeanor counts of reckless endangerment, and one felony count of endangering an aircraft have been filed in Multnomah County. Good Lord. He will also face federal charges of endangering a flight crew. So it's a lot. 11 of the passengers on board were under the age of 14. So uh, he is being held so he in custody. He's not had life. a detention hearing yet. Yeah, he really, he has. He has. Interesting, though, that his he's aware enough to realize he knew something is very wrong. Yeah. Like you got to, you know, cuff me. You got to subdue me. I'm about to do something terrible. He knew something was not right. But so very scary if he had managed to disable that plane. Yeah. Yeah. Unbelievable. So everyone's okay. He's in custody. And I just hope he gets the help that he needs because this is very it's a scary. sad story. Yeah. It is. It, it is sad because I don't know that there was any intent behind any of this. No, he, he just was just having a really bad trip. Having a major break with reality. And yeah, but boy, that is a scary position to be in. And, you know, pilots just they don't get a lot of grace when it comes to drug use and mental health issues. Like if that stuff's going on, yeah, you you can't be flying a plane. No. Cause that's just not safe for everyone. Mm -hmm. So we'll keep an eye on what happens with him. I hope that he gets help. I hope, you know, I'm just grateful. Everyone is okay. Him included. Mm -hmm. Cause it's just, it's a sad, it's a sad situation. It but I is. think when, when it first happened, it was really scary because it was like, oh, my God, is this a terrorist thing? Right. Yeah. Why would somebody it do something not. like that? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because it would have killed him, too. You know. Yeah. yeah. But no, it, it definitely is a, a, a mental health crisis. Mm-hmm. So scary oh. stuff. But yeah. thank heavens, everyone in this situation is OK. Yeah, for sure. And with that, Katie, I'm going to kick it over to you for our main case. Okay. Okay. 
Well, be prepared to be damn good and mad about the story uh -oh. I am about to tell you. So everyone, uh, okay. deep breaths, both feet on the floor. Don't be holding China. Okay. Oh, dear. Mm -hmm. I would like you to, to meet this sweet lady right here. Her name is Betterston Wade. Okay. She lives in Jackson, Mississippi. Okay. She's holding a picture of her son. Her son's name is Dexter Wade. Okay. Show you a couple more pictures of Dexter here. Here's Dexter with his daughters. I did heart out their mm -hmm. faces because mm -hmm. they are little children, but that is Dexter. Okay. Dexter was living with his mom. Dexter's really struggled as an adult. He's had some stints in prison. He's had some uh, hard drug use. He has a, a schizophrenia diagnosis. And... Oh has had a tough, tough time, um, but has had moments of, you know, of, of really doing well and was a beloved dad. He's been living with his mom and doing a lot better. And it's been just a better arrangement. And she has tried so hard to help him. But as we know, with the schizophrenia diagnosis, yeah. that can be tough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And... You know, uh, unfortunately, people uh, with schizophrenia diagnosis a lot of times do end up uh, addicted because they're trying to fix their brain, trying to feel right. better. Yeah. So none of that is super surprising to me, you know. Um, Dexter is 37. On March 5th, the evening of March 5th, he was supposedly going out with a friend and left mom's house and just never came home. And she was really worried about it. It wasn't like him to just take off like that. And, you know, because his mental health as it is, it was really worrisome to her. For sure. And so she was calling everybody she knew and posting online. And by the next day was kind of musing about, do I call the police? Do I not? And her family was like, I don't think we call the police. Because their family is currently in some litigation with the Jackson police because of a police brutality incident where her brother was killed. Oh, no. A Jackson police officer uh, in some way threw her brother to the ground, her 64-year-old brother to the ground, uh, oh. and caused an injury that killed him. Oh, my God. And so there's really hard feelings with this family and the Jackson police and a complete lack of trust here for obvious reasons. And so she kind of hesitated. Her family was like, don't call the police. That's not going to be good. And frankly, uh, whenever the police are called, when uh, we're talking about somebody with a serious mental health issue, it's a little dicey. And it is. It's, it's definitely something I have, you know been afraid of afraid of in the past for sure yeah yeah especially because uh there are things the de-escalation doesn't seem to be there also uh using certain uh detainments like uh tasers on people with schizophrenia can kill them there's a lot of reasons to be concerned uh but eventually she did call the police because he never came home and nobody knew anything and mm -hmm. so she finally called the police and they sent an investigator out that talked to her. She sent them over some pictures of him. They said that they would uh, look into it. Well, a week later, she contacted a different investigator. They said they had no idea, no idea what happened to her son, but they'd keep looking into it. They finally mm -hmm. filed some kind of missing persons uh, thing, spelled his name incorrectly. I mean, that's how much they just didn't care. Yeah. Uh, in the meantime, she is desperately looking for her son, hanging up flyers all over the place, posting online, talking to everybody she knows that may have known him. She's just flummoxed. And his poor little girls who stayed at their house part of the time, their dad is just in the wind, gone. And mm. she just doesn't understand why or what happened. Yeah. So on at least a weekly basis, she continues to call the police and ask them if they have learned anything about the disappearance of her son mm -hmm. and every time she is told nope no new news we don't know anything over and over 
there's just no, they're really not doing a thing. It doesn't seem like to help her, but also they just they're claiming that they just don't know. They haven't heard a thing. They have no idea. Mm. Show you a few of her Facebook posts here. This was on July 16th. Dexter been missing for almost five months. If anyone saw Dexter Wade, please call me. Dexter, your kids miss you. I miss you and your grandma. Sister, auntie, cousin, friends miss you. You don't have to come home. Just let us know you're all right. We love you. Because, of course, her mind's going everywhere. Did he run away? Right. A mental health disaster? Like, why is he gone? How, what is right. going on? Uh, here on Father's Day, Dexter, happy Father's Day. I'm trying to find you, but no one knows what happened to you. I wish someone would have saw you. I love you very much. Please come home. Please let me know you're all right or call me. Mm -hmm. Here we are on July 26th. Dexter, if you don't come home, please call me. Have a heart for your grandmother. She's hurt and worried about you. She's too old to be worried, baby. Uh, please, if anybody knows where he's been, call me. He's been missing for five months. That was mm -hmm. July 26th. Uh, she's desperate, just desperate. Oh, I would be too. That's awful. What is going on or what happened? And again, she has been calling the jail. Or, or not the jail, sorry. She's been calling the police over and over and over again. And they just keep telling her that they just don't have any ideas. <laughs> well, at the end of July, the investigator that had been on his case let her know that they were retiring and there would be a new investigator coming up. Okay. okay. Well, that's probably the best thing that happened because that investigator called her in August and said that she had found Dexter and that an officer would be out to talk to her. Oh, no. Now, I will say this. If you get that phone call, why? Why? Yeah. At that point, the investigator knew that Dexter was dead. So she calls her mother and says, we're going to send somebody out to talk to you rather than just come out and talk and to just her. Just go out and talk to her. Yeah. Holy shit. So she said when she, the investigator said that, she said, I knew he was dead. Oh. Um. So then she has to wait now for an officer to come out and talk to her. That right there just, I mean, the way she's been just treated cruel. overall just makes me so damn just mad. Cruel. But that piece, yeah. Yeah. What the hell? So an officer comes out and lets her know that uh, Dexter had been hit by a police cruiser and killed the night he disappeared. What the hell? A yeah. police officer hit him? And they didn't even bother. Yeah. I mean, they knew the whole time. They did. Oh he was hit God. on a six lane highway about a mile from her home. Oh, my God. And they never told her. So she asks that, that officer. His body this whole time. I'll get there. She asked the officer for more details. And he told her she'd have to call the coroner. You know, because the runaround just continues. Oh so she calls the coroner. And the coroner says that uh, it was an off-duty corporal that hit him. Supposedly, he was trying to cross a six-lane uh, highway mm. uh, on foot. And the corporal supposedly was driving a police uh, SUV and was off duty. Mm -hmm. Now, from the article uh, that ABC or the NBC put out this morning, the corporal who alerted police to the collision was not injured. He was not suspected of being under the influence of drugs or, of drugs or alcohol and was not given field sobriety tests. Oh, so they just magically knew? Mm-hmm. Nor was he cited for any traffic violations. The death was ruled accidental. With no investigation. Dexter Wait. suffered severe injuries, including to his head. 
A toxicology report later noted that Dexter had PCP and methamphetamine in his system, which is possible. So they but tested him, but not the driver of the car that killed him? Yeah. Yeah. The constant victim blaming. Mm-hmm. Constant well, victim blaming. My yeah. God. Never ending. When you hit this kid, if that's what really happened, mm-hmm. or this man, you had no idea who he was. You didn't know if he had drugs in his system. You didn't know if he was a felon. You didn't know anything. I get Nor so did any tired. of those things matter. Exactly. You hit and killed a human being. Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. And it was just swept up in a dustbin and shoved aside. So here's what the coroner told her. The coroner by the uh, last name of Elliot. Uh, the coroner told her that uh, he had a bottle of prescription medication in his pocket when he was killed. So they knew his name and his address immediately. There was never a question of them knowing who he oh, was. What the hell? So the coroner's office went to the pharmacy where uh, the meds had been prescribed and got his emergency contact information that is his mother and the coroner said that he tried to call betterston but she didn't answer and he left her a message well she says she didn't get a call or a message that she's aware of and so then he took all of that info and, and all of the info about uh, about Dexter and passed it along to the police whose job it was to notify next of kin. My God. And they just never did. And, and they just s- never gave a shit. No. Oh, my God. By the end of March, they were applying uh, to with the county to allow them to bury him as an indigent, as an unclaimed body. Oh, my God. They had her address, even if they couldn't get her by phone, but she says that is her phone number. Uh, Even if they couldn't reach her by phone, they had her freaking address. She just knocked on her door. Yeah, at any time. Or, I don't know, every single time she called them, they could have just told her the truth. Right. But none of those things happened. So his body stayed in the morgue until midsummer. And then they got permission to bury him in what they call a pauper's cemetery. Mm -hmm. And yeah, they got the first coroner's burial request on April 3rd. April 3rd. He had only been dead for four weeks. They did not even try at all. No. That is so disgusting. I can't even. Mm-hmm. <sighs> yep. So it was July 14th that he was buried in a field. They're calling it a penal farm mm-hmm. uh, with lots of other unclaimed bodies. So I'll show you a couple of pictures of that. This is the farm you can see all these little markers yeah these are all unclaimed bodies that were buried oh and then this is his he is uh corpse 672 oh my god so once she gets all of this information of course she wants to know where her son is buried right. it took her several weeks to hunt down who she was supposed to talk to and who could show her where her son was buried? Oh my God. It wasn't until October of this year, this month, that she actually was able to be taken out to where he's buried and see his grave. Oh, that just makes me feel sick. Oh my God. It's just unbelievable. Except it isn't. No. How many times have we it seen this kind of shit? Exactly. That is- sickest most inhumane bullshit to just let his poor mother and family search for him for all those months knowing damn well where he was and what happened shielding that officer that hit him obviously and not giving a flying fuck about him as a human being yeah nope so 
obviously she would like to exhume him and bury him right. properly and actually have a funeral and do right by him. Uh, she has a GoFundMe. I'm going to include it in this story. Uh, but if you don't see that, if you go to GoFundMe and search for Dexter Alex Wade, that's what it's posted under. But I want to say this to you, Betterston. Don't just bury that boy. No. You get a third party autopsy because something was you deserve to know. Yep, you deserve to know what's true. If this was genuinely an accident, why, why did, did they, they go just to all this trouble up? to cover yep. it up? Yep. You get enough money together in that GoFundMe. This is going national now and you're going to get it. You do. You find a third party lab and you have a, a third party autopsy. You, you, you gotta. Yeah. And make sure that you know what happened to this boy. I, I'm just, I'm so sad and hurt for her and angry. Oh. And how many stories do we have to do about the Jackson police and their corruption and the right? racist bullshit that's going on there? It seems like it's just never ending. Well, the, the level of cruelty that this oh. is, yeah. it's so depraved. I can't even. They, they can't even seem to give her a straight answer as to why this all happened. They just well, don't right. care. Of course they can't because then they would have to admit that they didn't want to tell anybody that this happened. They were yeah. protecting an officer. Yep. Yep. 150%. Yep. And if that officer was innocent of anything, then why didn't they just notify the family and this was a terrible accident? Right. I just don't believe for a second that it was. It's hard to want to believe that when they went to these level of lengths to cover this up, for sure. Yeah. They had his name. His address, his mother's name, and her address and phone number the day he died. And they made no effort whatsoever. No. That is just, oh, just yeah. makes me feel sick. Of course they're asking themselves, is this because of the litigation that we already have with Jackson? How could you not ask How yourself? How could you that? not ask that question? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. We don't know. But why in the world was this woman treated like this? So I do hope that a crazy good attorney comes up, up out of the woodwork right now to represent her yes. and help her out. I really hope that her GoFundMe gets well funded and I hope that she's yes. able to do everything that she needs and wants to do for her son at this point. Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. So there you have it. That is the story of Dexter Wade. So sending so much mm -hmm. love to the Wade family and his daughters, his mom, his grandma, and all the rest of his family that are hurting and are just so angry and confused and full of grief. And I hope they get everything, everything that they need. Absolutely. And more. Yeah. So oh, with that... So Oh, it's something. I am going to kick the mic back over to you for an MMIW case. Yes. Well, I guess this is our, our silent or not so silent rage episode. I guess. Yesterday was the funny talking. episode and today's the raging. Today, not so funny. Mm -mm. We are going to be talking about the death of Mika Westwolf. This is Mika on the right. And this trash human with the neck tattoo on the left is Sonny White, aptly named. Sonny lives in Montana. And she has she is now being charged for a hit and run on Mika. Oh. Uh, that happened back in March of this year. Mika was 22. She was hit on a highway outside of Arley, Montana, somewhere we just were like a month ago. Yeah. Um, let me tell you a little something about Sunny. Sunny has two children. Her four-year-old's name is Arian, and her two-year-old's name is Nation. 
Oh, dear God. Yeah. Oh, Sonny. Yeah. Oh. So. The accident happened on March 31st of 2023. Mika Westwolf was walking home on Highway 93. This was near White Coyote Road outside of Arley at 4.15 a.m. in Montana when she was hit. Um, so an officer, a tribal police officer, TJ Haynes, actually came upon the scene where there was vehicle debris in the road and a body uh, uh -huh. laying next to the road. That victim, that body was later identified as Mika Westwolf, who uh, sure. was a member of the Blackfeet tribe. So they felt like from the scene that, that Mika was walking in the northbound lane, when she was hit by the suspected vehicle, she was hit head on and died at the scene from multiple blunt force injuries. So at 5.23 a.m. that morning, uh, a Lake County Sheriff's officer saw a gold 2008 Cadillac Escalade with damage to the front and a missing passenger side mirror parked outside of Polson, which is another small town in that area. Another place we were not too long mm -hmm. ago. Uh, so the damage to the Escalade matched the description of the vehicle debris that they found like around on the ground around Mika's body. So the deputy saw a woman who turned out to be Sunny White taking uh, items out of the car and putting them into another car. Uh -huh. She uh, told the deputy that her SUV was overheating and that she had called a friend to help her. Gee, I, I wonder why it was overheating, Sunny. I don't know. Uh, Damage to the radiator, maybe, from hitting something? Yeah. Huh. She told the officer that she hit a deer and that she didn't remember where it happened. She told the officer that she was passing a bottle back to Baby Nation and didn't see the deer. Oh, sure. Yes. She said she was driving from Kalispell to Butte for the weekend with her children. She said that she hadn't been using she hadn't been using alcohol and that she hadn't used methamphetamine or fentanyl in a week, guys. Oh, not for a week. Uh, the officer didn't buy any of this. Mm -hmm. She was shaky um, and sort of nodding in and out of sleep in the back of the car, the police vehicle, and he felt like she was under the influence of opiates or something. Yeah. So took her to the hospital for a blood draw. Um, she refused the blood draw, so they had to get a search warrant. So it took about four hours after the crash before they got her um, blood draw. But they did find that she did test positive for methamphetamine and fentanyl. They also found in her vehicle um, a little makeup tube that had meth inside. They found five <sighs> syringes and two unopened packages of Narcan inside as well. Yeah. So a bottle for been... Baby Nation, my ass. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and her children were in the car. Sure Aaron and Nation were in the car during this accident. So, of course, Mika Westwolf's family are absolutely heartbroken and have started uh, a movement called Mika Matters to raise awareness for missing and murdered Indigenous people in Montana, which is a huge problem in Montana. Yeah. Uh, it has been seven months now since... Um, Mika was killed. Her family's statement says, as we mark seven months since Mika's tragic passing, it is essential to acknowledge that this arrest is just the beginning of the journey toward the ju towards justice. So, yeah. in light of all of this, Sonny White was just arrested. Seven months later. Seven months. Uh, she was arrested um, and given a $200,000 bond. She has bailed out. Um, we don't know yet what's going to happen from there, but she has at least been charged now. But why in the hell did it take but, seven months? Right. Why did it take seven months? She was this clearly isn't that complicated. Influence. She huh. was driving the car that killed this poor woman. She had paraphernalia on her. She tested positive for meth and fentanyl. Come on. Come on, Montana. And I'm you sorry. That Mika deserves a whole lot better than this. Yeah. I don't care what the uh, circumstances are. If a person that is that racist, that they actually name their kids that, 
Right. And they hit and kill a person of color. To me, that is a hate crime. And, and you know, come at me if you want to, but it doesn't take a genius to see that this person is full of hate. And yeah, she absolutely. killed this beautiful native girl. She lied about it. No. If it was genuinely an accident, why didn't she stay with her, call the police, yeah. call the paramedics, do all the right things? She didn't do any of the right things no. at all. She didn't care. No. No. She didn't give a flying fuck. No, she didn't. So we're going to be keeping an eye on this because we certainly want to see Sunny White get all of the justice that she deserves and for Mika Westwolf's family to get the justice that they deserve as well. Well, and hopefully those children can end up with in a better situation with people with brains that will rename them and change their can lives you for the better. Naming your babies Aryan and Nation. I, I it's just unfathomable to me. Mm-hmm. Yep. Damn. Boo, oh. Sunny. Sucks to suck. Yeah, it does. I'm glad she's arrested. I hope they absolutely throw the book at her and she gets everything mm-hmm. that she deserves because she better. She does deserve it. Mm-hmm. And the world doesn't deserve any more of her. No, my God. Poor Mika didn't deserve an ounce of this. No, she didn't. Nor did nor does anyone else who has probably faced the wrath of this hideous woman. Yeah. Yeah. Right. What else has she done? Because this yeah. can't be just it. No, it definitely can't. Nope. Well, that's okay. what I got. Well, happy lots, Wednesday. Whew, oh. lots, lots of love to Mika's family. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And and keep an eye out for the Mika Matters movement. If you see it, support it or go Definitely. find it and support it. Yeah. All righty. Well, this is our Wednesday episode. So if you're mm-hmm. good and mad now, I figured you would be. Maybe go take a walk. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to be back in just a couple of hours at 7 p.m. Mountain for case updates. And so watch for that and come join us live. This has been yet another production of the True Crime Squad. Take care. Bye, everybody.